Jackie, take me through your reporting. Well, I think the most notable part of my reporting from today with uh, my colleague Carol Lennig is some of these emails that we're going to be seeing tomorrow for the first time. Uh, since the committee ended their last hearing, the Department of Homeland Security turned over a mountain of new evidence, as you pointed out, uh, over a million different documents, although notably not the deleted text messages uh, that the committee was originally seeking from January 6th and January 5th, but a lot of other emails, Microsoft Teams, and communications between Secret Service agents and other administration officials, which we're going to be seeing tomorrow. One of those emails uh, that we may are, and are, are very likely to see is newly obtained documents uh, between 1.30 and 2.30 p.m., where a Secret Service supervisor had checked in with Bobby Engel the person who was uh, with the former president, his sort of head body person, who was seeking an urgent update about whether or not Trump's plan to go to the Capitol, despite the very apparent violence that was going on, was officially quashed. This is uh, another piece of information that is corroborative of what we've already seen from the committee, the testimony that we heard from Cassidy Hutchinson, uh, and testimony we've heard from various other witnesses who knew firsthand of the former president's intentions on that day, despite the uh, the reports, the surveillance footage, and, and many other different uh, streams of information that were coming in, notifying the White House and his top allies that there was violence uh, and that, that there was the threat of violence as well. Let me play some of the radio traffic that illustrates um, what, what seems to represent where the investigation headed after that last public hearing. There's an individual in a tree, maybe a white male, about six feet tall, thin build, brown cowboy boots. He's got blue jeans and a blue jean jacket, and underneath the blue jean jacket, the complainants both saw a stock of an AR-15. He's going to be with a group of individuals, about five to eight, five to, uh, eight other individuals. Two of the individuals in that group at the base of the tree near the porta potties were wearing green fatigues, green olive dress style fatigues, about five eight five nine, skinny, uh, skinny white males, brown cowboy boots. They had Glock style pistols in their waistband. Eighty seven thirty six with the message that subject um, weapon on his right hip. Oh. That he's in the tree. Motor one, make sure PPD knows they have an elevated threat in the tree south side of Constitution Avenue. Look for the don't tread on me flag, American flag face mask, cowboy boots, weapon on the right, right side hip. I got three men walking down the street in fatigue while carrying AR-15, copy at 14th Independent. Ron Johnson, your armed insurrection is calling. Um, uh, Jackie Alamany, what's PPD stand for? Yeah, I mean, that surveillance, that uh, radio frequency, by the way, was very difficult for the January 6th committee to initially get their hands on. And once that, that frequency landed in their laps, there was a realization that Secret Service might not have as been uh, as forthcoming or cooperative as they um, had uh, sort of uh, communicated that they were. This then caused the committee to go back to DHS and request every single channel of, of available radio frequency from that day. We do know that that those were those frequencies uh, and recordings were also handed over, so we could be hearing additional um, communications that were ha that was happening in real time uh, played tomorrow, as well as new surveillance footage along the lines of, of what you just played, Nicole. Um, a lot of this information as well, I should point out, is going to poke more holes in Bobby Engel and Tony Ornato's story, according to uh, our committee sources. As one investigator said to me, uh, you know, this is going to point out that these guys were just not being very honest, including in their closed door deposition when they often were responding to detailed questions that Cassidy Hutchinson was able to answer, uh, but they were responding that they couldn't recall. And we've heard uh, that the information that's going to be put forward really shows that it, that that shouldn't have been the case that that these two men who were really integral to um, the president's actions that day uh, that they shouldn't have had such a short memory when it when it came to uh, these various incidents. 
I mean, Harry, the significance, and let me read some more of Jackie's um, incredible reporting with her colleague, Carol Ennig. So, so this is what, what they have. Some of the information, this is from Jackie and Carol's story, quote, some of the information the people said calls into question the previous testimony of Engel and Ornato, then a Secret Service leader who was serving in an unprecedented political role of White House Deputy Chief of Staff. Both men told the committee in closed-door depots that they could not recall certain events relayed by other witnesses, including Trump's demand that the Secret Service let armed people into his rally. Um, they also write that one of the committee's newly obtained documents shows that sometime between 1.30 and 2 p.m., a senior Secret Service supervisor for protective operations emailed Trump security detail leader Bobby Engel with an urgent update and seeking to know if Trump's plan to go to the Capitol was successfully quashed. It came after a tumultuous hour for the Secret Service detail, which had effectively ignored a command from the president, which was to go down to the insurrection. Even with Trump back at the White House, Secret Service headquarters wanted to be sure the president was staying put. I mean, PPD, I believe, is presidential personal detail, presidential protective detail. And this means that they were communicating the threat assessment for the president's protective detail because they knew that he wanted to go to the insurrection. I mean, it seems that the committee now has him dead to rights as being fully aware, not just that there was violence in a vague sense, which you could see on TV, but he had the kind of granular details that there was um, two individuals at the base of a tree near porta potties wearing green fatigues, green olive dress house fatigues, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, skinny white males with AR-15 style weapons. He knew exactly what was there. He said, I'm the effing president. Um, they won't shoot me, take down the effing max. It feels like all of the questions about the spontaneity of the violence and the president's knowledge of the violence are blown out of the water by the committee developing these threads of the investigation. That's basically right, and that's the important point. This isn't about Hutchinson versus Ornato. Ornato's credibility is in tatters, and oh, after all, all Hutchinson said is, this is what Ornato told me. But there's essentially no doubt, because of this transmission and others, that, of course, Trump wanted to go to the ellipse, and the broader point about his relationship to the violence. He he knew they were armed. He, told the, he said, get them away from the magnometers. He spurred on the violence. He uh, watched as the violence proliferated. He later basically um, uh, apologized for or said or sympathized with the rioters. That's the point here, not an Ornato Hutchinson point. This has become, maybe it started as a general history, but it's a tragedy now about one evil tyrant being Donald Trump. That's the focus they're going to keep it on tomorrow. And whatever the details, of Ornato versus Hutchinson, the fact, the fact that Trump wanted, of course, to go there and get and foment even further his rabid followers, really, as you say, will not be in doubt. Um, Harry, what sort of exposure do people who may have lied to the committee have? It's straightforward now, or I believe Ornato was not in deposition, it was an interview, but nevertheless, you make a false statement and the uh, crime is 1,001, it's a felony. You know, you could you could do five dozen of these from, from every hearing. I don't expect that they will be a wholesale, you know, practice from DOJ in 1,001s, but that's the exposure they have. And of course, if it's perjury, but that is to say they've sworn it's worse. But it's against the law, but probably they'll get a pass. How did we get to this point where the Secret Service um, is either wittingly or unwittingly going in and lying about an insurrection? Oh, boy. You know, we've seen a, a gradual radicalization of uh, law enforcement in the United States. I mean, one of the hallmarks of encroaching fascism and authoritarianism is that the the referees, the, the legal people, the police, all become habituated to this kind of culture of violence. I mean, uh, it, it's kind of amazing to see what is happening at the hearing. I mean, we've already made assumptions about what we think Trump did. But what they've done is kind of beautiful storytelling. It's kind of a concentric circle from an outside circle of police yeah. officers, uh, people who were hurt that day, then a medium circle of people around Trump, and then to the core, to the heart of the conspiracy, Donald Trump himself. And that's what they're, that's the nail they're going to hit on the head tomorrow, because it may be their last hearing. It's a kind of closing argument, and they just want to say, this guy was responsible 
He knew exactly everything was going on with a potential violent insurrection of the United States, something we've never experienced before, the worst situation we've had since the Civil War. And he was in the heart of the heart of it. And he just wanted to go there. He wanted to have a kind of Custer's last stand himself.